This is Epicenter, episode 361 with guest Kyle Samani. Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like the podcast, well, there's only one way that you can support us that costs nothing and makes me really happy, and that is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're on a Mac or an iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks apple. Today, our guest is Kyle Samani. He's the co-founder and managing partner at Multicoin Capital. Multicoin Capital is a thesis-driven investment firm that invests in cryptocurrencies, tokens, and blockchain companies. And we had Kyle on the podcast with his co-founder, Tushar Jain, in 2018. So it's been over two and a half years. So we talked to Kyle to catch up on Multicoin and also how his thinking had evolved since we last had him on. Of course, in 2018, we were in the heart of the ICO bubble, and since then, the ecosystem has matured. We now have many more layer one protocols built on solid technology and lots more decentralized finance applications or DeFi built on top of these protocols. What's remarkable is how little the multi-coin thesis has changed over the years. Kyle is extremely bullish on smart contract platforms, and DeFi is one of their main areas of focus. They have invested in several projects and companies like Definity, Helium, Cadena, LifePeer, Near Protocol, and Algorand. And if you're building DeFi and open finance applications, you should definitely check out Algorand. It's fast, it scales, it's secure, and it has instant finality. And they've built several DeFi primitives right into the protocol. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later in the interview. But for now, here's our conversation with Kyle Samani. Hi, and welcome. We're here with Kyle Samani. Kyle is the founder and managing partner of Multicoin. We already had Kyle on. This was like, we were just calculating before, I think 138 episodes ago. That was in February 2018, sort of when there was a big uh, crypto boom time. And many funds were started, and among them, Multicoin. And so, yeah, thanks so much for uh, coming on again, Kyle. Hey, Brian, Sebastian, thank you guys for uh, for having me on the show. It was an honor to be on back then. Uh, it, was, it was one of my favorite podcasts, continues to be, uh, and excited to be on two and a half years later. Now we can see how some stuff has, has panned out. Uh, I feel blessed. Love the show. Excited to be back on. So... On your website, it says Multicoin is like a thesis-driven fund. So I'm curious, what is, do you mind like reiterating, what is the Multicoin thesis and has it changed since you were on last time? Yeah, so we have three kind of mega theses that guide all of our investments. They're on our website. If you go to multicoin.capital and there's like a thesis button at the top. And those three mega theses are what we call open finance, uh, we think DeFi is uh, a part of open finance, although I, I think it's open finance is bigger than just DeFi. Number two is Web3, which I'll just kind of loosely define as trust-minimized technology to help people coordinate some sort of economic activity. Uh, and then the third mega thesis uh, would be the opportunity for non-sovereign money. You can kind of most simplistically think about that as, as digital gold, but I actually think that that understates the opportunity. It's pretty clear that like by making gold digital and like having a smart contract platform that can do fancy what well, you know fancy stuff like you get both something that has monetary properties and has some sort of utility properties and also just like every human on the planet can theoretically own these things and use these things every day and that that to me is market expansionary relative to just gold um, so those are kind of the three big theses that, that guide our investments. Within those, we have like kind of subsectors of areas we're interested in. Uh, for example, we're very interested at the intersection of, of telecom and, and blockchains and happy to touch on, on why and just generally internet infrastructure uh, and blockchains. Very interested in kind of geographic bets around the world. Um, and I think we've done a good job as a firm at, at being pretty international. 
so, so those are our three theses that guide our investments. They haven't really changed since we started. I think what has changed is, is our we just solidified them. You know, we launched Multicoin in uh, October of 2017. And at the time, like there was a lot of stuff happening, but we just, I couldn't fully kind of wrap my head around all of the things crypto is useful for. And it took us until early 2019 to really sit down and say, look, we've been doing this for a couple of years. What is everything we've seen and how do we synthesize this into some sort of coherent framework? And that, that really produced uh, our mega theses that guide our investments today. I was looking through some of the show notes for the last episode. One of the theses we discussed back then, or maybe this kind of falls, um, was that the most used smart contract platform will produce the winning store of value. Is this something you still believe? Or like, how do you think this uh, thesis has turned out? Yeah, so... I still, I, I like more firmly believe now than I ever have that some smart contract platform will surpass Bitcoin and become the global non-sovereign money. It's very clear today that if you fast forward five years from now, to call it go to year 2025, 2026, there is going to be one or multiple smart contract, what probably between one and three smart contract platforms that are facilitating trillions of dollars of economic activity on a daily, weekly, if not maybe daily basis. Like that to me, I basically take for granted will be true. And it's not very hard to extrapolate from here to get there. And so like in that world, like that's stuff is happening and you've got all kinds of consumer applications, finance applications, all this stuff running on some sort of smart contract platform. And then you've got Bitcoin, which is just like your pet rock and you put it under your mattress. And like, it, it's just like, it just doesn't do anything, you know? And like... People say, well, it doesn't have to do anything and gold hasn't done anything historically. And like, I, I you know, I, I, I try and give um, perspective to like the, the historical power of, of kind of the story of gold. But I think that that fails to account like how do large scale asset allocators think about their investments? Um, yeah, I spent a, a fair bit of my time talking to like large endowments, foundations, pensions, sovereign wealth funds, large family offices, like you know, folks with big, big dollars. And one thing that has surprised me is quite how many of them think gold is dumb. Like they think non-productive assets just generally are really stupid. Warren Buffett's probably the most famous person in this school of thought where he's just like all the gold in the world, you just put it there and you can sit in a pool and come back in a hundred years and it's done nothing and produced nothing of value for the world. And like, therefore gold is dumb. And like, that's a pretty reasonable view. You can disagree with it, but it's like not unreasonable. And anyone who's, you know, allocating tens of billions or hundreds of billions of dollars, like all of these people are always thinking about returns and yields and, you know, productive precious metals don't do anything. And so I think the opportunity for just a much more nuanced, both monetary policy and, you know, real utility is a, is a huge, huge value driving factor. And so there's kind of two, like all these, these layer ones, like all give you the same, same basic cryptographic guarantees, right? Like they all use more or less the same cryptography. And then they all have some monetary policy of some form. Now people yell and scream at each other about like which one's a better monetary policy, but like they all have some sort of monetary policy of some sort. And when I look at smart contract platforms, I see two things they offer kind of natively that Bitcoin cannot. The first is organic staking and yield uh, that effectively will act as the risk-free rate um, in these systems, which is super powerful. And then the second is uh, MEV. In any of these proof of stake systems, like MEV is going to be a thing. Uh, we already see MEV happening today on Ethereum, um, and that's pretty clear. There's been a few tweet storms in the last few weeks, like showing, you know, like there's real dollars going into MEV now. And in proof of stake systems, MEV effectively becomes a DCF for, uh, like it gives you an actual way to, to calculate a DCF for the underlying value of the asset. And so what's cool about like, if you fast forward five years, like it, it's again, like this seems like a basically 100% certainty that we're going to have some large amount of money flowing through some smart contracts. If the thing's going to have monetary prop properties and it's going to have a, a native risking, you know, risk free rate and yield, and it's going to have MV, MEV. And all of those things can be used to, to derive some sort of, of, of objective value. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty bullish that like that confluence of things will, will happen. I think the biggest question is will that converge on a single? you know, layer one asset or will there be, you know, two or three layer one assets that kind of share in that, in that pie? Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. So talking about gold here, I thought that was an interesting uh, kind of statement there that so many 
seemingly smart people in finance think think the gold and non productive assets are useless. Do you think this is a? Do you think this sort of signals a shift uh, in, uh, in maybe financial and econ- economic policy and thinking? Whereas in in our modern economy, tangible assets are perhaps no longer necessary to the functioning of an economy, as was the case, you know, previously, even just you know a hundred years ago. I, I think I see what you're saying. So I I, I don't have a super good sense of like history and, and how call it finance people thought 100 years ago but if you just go like benjamin graham warren buffett kind of value investing school of thought which predates um 1971 when you know nixon broke the gold standard pre-gold standard or sorry pre-breaking the gold standard um gold was more or less money right and paper bills were just a, a claim on gold and Nixon just realized you just don't need to do that. <laughs> and so just, you know, break the peg. In the world since then, the question is like, do you want, like, I guess the question is like, do you value the fiat currency that you pay your taxes in or do you value gold because you have some sort of like deeper belief about like the nature of scarcity and like what that means for, you know, wealth distribution and like how human humanity allocates resources I never got into crypto because I like had like strong, like deep macroeconomic beliefs about like Austrian economics and like the nature of scarcity in the world. I know that obviously was like the foundation of crypto, but like that didn't draw me in. I'm guessing for the two of you that like wasn't the, your primary calling either. My sense is that like basically 100% of the libertarians and like the Austrian economists in the world today have maxed out their Bitcoin purchases. Like I think anyone who actually believes those things today and like you know, has an internet connection, like has acquired all of the Bitcoin that they can afford to acquire. And so like, I just think they're all, they're just all in. And so, like, it's clear that like that dollar number of, is just not going to get you to Bitcoin 100K, right? Like it's barely getting you to Bitcoin 10K. And like to get from Bitcoin 10K to Bitcoin 100K, you, you just need new dollars to come in. And like the new dollars coming in are by definition much, much less ideological. Uh, and they're much more utilitarian driven. And it's pretty clear. I mean, just look at like, there's about $750 trillion of wealth in the world, like ish. That's kind of the, the you know, value of wealth. Um, gold is 7 trillion, 8 trillion, whatever it is right now. So it's about 1% of the world's wealth is stored in gold. Uh, you can look at some other precious metals and other smaller commodities, but like, let's just round up the 10 trillion for simplicity. Like we're talking 1% and change of the world's assets are in, in gold. And basically all the other assets are productive. They're either equity, debt, or real estate comprise the, the substantial majority of the rest of that. And then fiat currency is like another 50 to 100 trillion, depending on how you would account. But something like 80% of the world's assets are productive. And I suspect that will, you know, be true in perpetuity because just like the world needs productive assets. That Like that's how the economy grows. Yeah, that's an interesting argument. So do you see, I mean, we have seen in you know this year even you know things like paul tudor jones or you know in in this kind of more traditional asset management circle it does seem that there is like some traction that bitcoin is gaining do you do you agree with this and if so like how do you like how do you situate that in in those different in the breakdown of asset classes yeah so Today, as people are worried about governments printing money and, and runaway inflation, and I mean, like, Jerome Powell went on television a few weeks ago and was like, yeah, 2% inflation, like, it's okay if we like, we'll go above that, which is like a scary, crazy new thing. And so, like, given that reality, Bitcoin simply is digital to gold is an interesting bet, at least for the foreseeable future. I, th- I think the question to ask is, what would cause that to change? And I think the, just the, the, the reality is that, like, Ethereum, which is definitively the second largest thing in crypto by really every measure you can you can count is just like still extremely small scale and just kind of everything that it does i mean like there's no you know the amount of trading volume that happens there is a fraction of what happens on centralized exchanges which is a fraction of what happens on equities or fx or other you know global markets the number of daily users here is like 100 200 thousand like range right it's just like no one if you are allocating 50 billion dollars 100 billion dollars whatever it is you look at crypto, you're like, this Ethereum thing is interesting. These smart contracts, it's, it's like, it's clearly interesting. Like, it, it's it's impossible to look at this and say, like, this is not cool. And like, this is not important. But then you look at the actual scale of adoption and usage. And you're like, okay, how many people are using this thing? And what are they using it for? And those numbers all round to zero. Like, again, for anyone who's dealing with $50 billion plus of capital allocation, 
and like, like also consider like what are companies that are worth 50, Ethereum is worth called 50 billion today, 40, 50 billion, right? Something like that. What are companies that are worth that much money? And like Slack is up there, like Zoom is up there, uh, like Twilio is somewhere in that range. You look at those companies, Uber is in that range, right? And it's like, you look at those things and you're like, okay, like these have some impact on the world, right? Which let's call it was worth $40 billion plus or minus. And you look at Ethereum's impact on the world. And like, it's not a question that Ethereum has like dramatically less impact on the world than any of those companies I just named. Because just the sheer amount of utility that those things provide for humanity is like huge, right? And I understand Ethereum is different. Like it's hard to do apples and apples comparisons, but it's just like if 200,000 people use this thing every day and then Twilio sends like a trillion text messages every day that like power, you know, just like all the world's communications, like you just, it's just a different scale of like utility for humanity. And so I think most rational capital allocators in the world look at that and say, yeah, Ethereum is cool. Smart contracts are cool, but like there's 200,000 people using this thing. Like this is not, this is not achieved escape velocity. Um, it may achieve escape velocity at some point, but like it hasn't today. And so I think all of those people looking at crypto are like, okay, Ethereum's cool. Maybe it wins. Maybe it doesn't win. We don't know. Let's just put money in Bitcoin for now and we'll come back in 12 or 24 months and like see what happens then. And I think that's, if you're, again, a sovereign wealth fund, a pension fund, like anyone at that scale, like that is the rational way to think about the space. And so your, your thesis is that we will, you know, we will see other assets that are kind of emerge from smart contract platforms that actually reach scale with, you know, million, like, you know, it, it Uber scale. And that then the native assets of those chains will over time kind of displace uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I think so. I think I think it's going to take a while. Like you're going to need something that's been operating at scale. My, my kind of general number is 100 million users. When something hits 100 million users, that's like the scale when Facebook like gets like scared, right? Like Google pays attention at 100 million users. Like 10 million users, Google and Facebook don't even pay attention to you. And so at that, that's kind of the, to me, is like escape velocity scale. And so when you have something that's like at 100 million, you know, daily actives, then it has the potential to like potentially surpass Bitcoin. But until you get to there, I, I don't think that's, that's even on the table. What are your bets in terms of who will win that race? Yeah, so we made a, a handful of bets um, in, in this space, layer ones and layer twos. Uh, we don't own any Ether today. We haven't owned any Ether for probably two years, a year and a half, two years. Um, that actually doesn't, doesn't reflect our views on ETH, the assets. Um, it's a reflection of if Ethereum is going to win and be successful, I would rather own other much smaller cap assets that are tied to Ethereum, the ecosystem, that just will have much more upwards price mobility. So like the graph is a very good example of that. Scale is another example. Um, those types of bets, we just prefer to be long those things because I think you have much, much better uh, risk reward ratios than owning ETH itself at $40 billion. So we're long the Ethereum ecosystem uh, through those kinds of bets. And then we have bet on a handful of other layer ones, most notably Nier, uh, Solana, Algorand, and Mina Protocol, uh, and Definity. Um, so those have been the ones we made. And of those, we've been pretty publicly um, most supportive and bullish about Solana. And we do own, that is our largest you know, layer one position. Back in January, we interviewed Steve Kokinos and Sylvia McCalley of Algorand. And during our conversation, we talked about how Algorand's unique design makes it easy for developers to build sophisticated applications on their platform. So what's great about Algorand, beyond the fact that it's fast, it's secure, it scales, and it has instant finality, is the fact that they've designed a layer one protocol with primitives that are purpose-built for DeFi. So what that means is that they've taken some of the most common things that people do with smart contracts and they've embedded them right in the system, right in the layer one. So things like issuing tokens, atomic transfers, well, these are built into the layer one and smart contracts are first class citizens on Algorand. So with these essential building blocks at your disposal, you can build fast and secure DeFi apps in no time. To learn more about what Algorand brings to the table and how to get started, I would encourage you to check out algorand.com slash epicenter. That lets them know that you heard about it from us and it takes you where you need to go to learn about their tech. And with that, we'd like to thank Algorand for supporting the podcast. So I'm curious, I mean, one of the things that I think is, is to be noted, I guess, about the other layer ones other than Ethereum is the, the difficulty that these projects have in attracting developers to build applications on their platforms. 
And, you know, for something like Cosmos, there's like decent community there of people building applications and then, uh, you know, perhaps on Polkadot. And then it, it kind of trails off from there. I feel like there's, there isn't that much traction on these other platforms other than, you know, perhaps speculating on a token. You know, what, what do you think is the thing that, that kind of sparks development on these other platforms? Or do you think that there will be, you know, consolidation around uh, one or two major platforms, you know, looking 10, 15 years into the future? So I, I am a one chain maximalist. Um, now, I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon. Like that, that feels 10 years away. But like, I believe that there should be one magical chain that does everything and that works for everyone. Uh, I realize that that can happen, but that's kind of my ideal state of the world. It's pretty clear that it's, I think over the next, I think 24 months from now, it will be very clear which two or three chains matter. Um, I think it's very unlikely that 24 months from now, people actually think like chain number six has a shot. Just the marginal benefit of being chain number four, number five, it, it's just, it's just so small. So I, I feel quite confident that yeah, three, basically three ecosystems will matter. Uh, Ethereum is more or less guaranteed to be one of those. And then the question is kind of what are the other one or two? In terms of like the first question of, of how do you attract developers? So there, there's a few ways to think about this. So one is gas fees on Ethereum have forced people to go elsewhere. Um, and you can see this, this happening now. Um, I can't disclose a couple of names, but there's some, some folks who are pretty large users of POA network, for example, um, that are like currently in the process of building, like moving outright to another chain. There are a lot of folks like, look at like the Braves of the world, the Reddits of the world, the like Snapchats of the world. There's all of these people who are all looking at crypto and they're all interested, right? Like they all see something and you know they all want to do something there. But like they can't do it on Ethereum today. It's actually impossible. We'll see how kind of the results of this Reddit layer two baking scale off thing. But like it's clear that they just don't want to make a decision. Like they've told everyone we're interested, but like they're just buying time, which is actually the, the rational thing to do. Like if you're the CTO of Reddit, the right thing to do is just to say, we're just probably too early. Let's just talk to everyone and stay in touch with everyone and like see what's, you know, what's going to happen. And like that is the rational thing to do. And so like just imagine, like let's just say tomorrow for simplicity, the Reddit guys come out and say, we're going to build everything on Nier or we're going to build everything on Solana, right? I'm not making any predictions. I'm not close to the Reddit team. Just hypothetical that happens. Does that completely reshape the competitive landscape of the entire ecosystem? And like, I'm fairly certain the answer is yes, like in a massive way. Um, because the scale any of these distribution platforms provide is so much larger than the entirety of crypto combined, like times 10. And so I, I think it's very, it's very easy for all of us who like we talk to each other on crypto Twitter to be like, oh, there's no one using these new things. A, that's not true. They're just early. I mean, look at where Ethereum was in early 16, right? Like Solana has been out for six months. Nier has been out for a week or something. Um, Polkadot's been out for, I don't know, a few months now. So it was just, just early. But like you can see s stuff happening. And, uh, and then, so, so A, it, stuff is happening. And B, it's not very hard to see any of these large scale people pulling the trigger in a major way uh, on, on one of these platforms. And again, I, I'm fairly certain that will happen at some point. When is unclear, but it will it will happen. And I, I don't I don't take it for granted that they're going to use, use Ethereum. Okay, so the, so what you're saying is that the the major inflection point may come when large Web two companies start building on yes on blockchain platforms. Okay, D distribution matters more than anything else. Like, forget about your ideological beliefs about anything. Forget about programming environments. The the maturity of dual tool sets. Like all of that stuff rounds to zero when you say we have 50 million users using our thing every day, whatever the thing is, and we're going to like start using some blockchain to do X or Y or Z. It's just like every other variable combined does not matter. Um, distribution matters more than anything in the world. And so, um, and we know, I mean, Brave is like very clearly thinking about crypto, right? Like, <laughs> you know, like we know that Reddit's been thinking about crypto. Snapchat hasn't said anything publicly, but like you can imagine there's like some cool stuff to do around some NFTs and some other like types of payment things in there to like compete asymmetrically with, with Instagram and Facebook. Like it's not that hard to see these guys doing some pretty interesting things. Twitter obviously like keeps talking about it, although like I don't know how you're going to build any of that stuff on Bitcoin, but you know, like the stuff's going to happen. And um, those, those CTOs making those decisions 
are not ideological for the most part. And like their number one constraint is scale. Like all of those guys, right? Their job is to think about how do we serve 100 million daily active users. Um, and so scale is like their number one requirement. So in the, in the crypto space, right? So you have Bitcoin and you have Ethereum that had these, you know, kind of unusual uh, stories of uh, coming about and, you know, the, the, the investors and token holders and like that kind of took uh, some, some course that was, you know, unprecedented. And then after that, we had, you know, the, there was, of course, crackdown on token sales and, you know, the, the most of those layer ones that are now kind of coming up to compete, they've, you know, approached in a different way, right? They've mostly raised from VCs and accredited investors. And, you know, there is definitely, I think, some, let's say in the Ethereum community, some resistance to, to that, right? There's something that they prefer about the, the Ethereum approach. So I'm wondering, do you think this is going to be a significant factor that we're going to have these kind of, uh, you know, maybe differences in philosophy or is in the end, this is just going to be, you know, whoever can give the scalability or the cost will win and the rest kind of doesn't matter. Yeah, I am a, I'm a utilitarian at heart. Like, so, so some fun examples to think through in history. Microsoft was like notoriously, like Bill Gates was an asshole. And like Steve Ballmer and all those guys. And like they kind of took over the world for a while. If you look at Linux, like Linux is really without question the most important piece of software in the world. It powers Android and it powers like every single server. <laughs> like runs Linux, right? Like it's the most important piece of software that humanity has ever produced. And like Linus is a total, total jackass. Like he's really like insufferable as a human being. Uh, and like, again, this is like public information. Like no one, no one's going to contest this. Uh, even Linus won't contest it, <laughs> right? So I, I don't know. So like one is I just look at like the history of software and it's not that like Bill Gates was evil or Linus was evil. It's just like the whole community thing, uh, I'm, I'm skeptical that like it, it has value, but it doesn't, it's not the defining thing that has caused large scale software things to win in the past. So that, that's kind of one way to think about this. The other is, again, just like, if tomorrow, you know, Brave or Reddit or whatever says, like, we're going to turn on, you know, start doing all this stuff on one of these platforms, it's like, where do app developers, where does the marginal app developer go? And, like, they can go build on Ethereum, which has distribution of X, whatever X is today. And then they can say, oh, we're going to go build on, you know, some new DeFi thing or some new Web3 application or whatever on this platform that, like, we know is natively integrated into pick, pick large, you know, consumer app. And, like... It's just like, okay, if you're a developer, you've got X amount of time to, to build stuff. Like, where are you going to you know, go? And I, like, everyone kind of hates Apple and look at Epic Games is fighting with Apple right now, but it doesn't matter. We all have to put up with Apple shit because Apple is Apple. Like, they control distribution to the, to the iPhone, right? Like, distribution matters more than everything. And there's tons and tons of examples of business history uh, about the people who own distribution, you know, like controlling, not controlling, but being able to strongly influence the rest of the industry. I think most rational developers who just want to build cool stuff and get it out there in the world and, and create value for users are going to say, okay, like I want, like it doesn't matter what I think I, I believe about the history of the Ethereum story. Like at the end of the day, I want to build something useful for the world. So like, where am I going to go build it? So one of the interesting things uh, I read was in a blog post wrote a few months ago where it was talking about uh, comparing DeFi and, and CeFi. And in particular, you talked about, you know, latency. And we're like talking about, hey, you know, uh, decentralized exchanges have this latency issue, let's say on Ethereum, and they're too slow, and that causes all these restrictions, and that's why they're not going to like, you know, be able to compete with centralized exchanges. And now, of course, you've had Uniswap, which has reached like big scale. What are your thoughts on that? Is, has your view on latency changed? N no, one, the one more answer is no, it hasn't. So again, if you think about like the idea of like liquidity pools for trading versus central and order books, the guys on Wall Street who trade, you know, Jane and Susquehanna and Citadel and Two Sigma and Renaissance and, and Jump and all these big and DRW and all these big prop shops. I mean, the number of, of like finance PhDs and economics PhDs and like distributed systems and computer science PhDs, like these guys employ, all right? I mean, like it's the caliber of, of brain power and talent is like astonishing. And so like, and all these guys are obviously like hyper, hyper competitive. Um, and they have effectively unlimited resources. 
And so like being like, aha, the future of like trading is X, Y equals K. It's just like, wait, what? Like, like, no, like, you know, just like, there's just like millennia of sophistication has like gone into thinking about like the nuances of like, how do you provide liquidity effectively and make markets and like do these things. And the idea that you can take all of that nuance and combine it into a single formula and then, and then have people display that formula publicly and say like, here you go, please trade against me. Like, I, I just like, I, I logically do not understand how that's possible. That like that can outcompete what has been around for the last, you know, call it 50 years or so of like sophisticated market making. I, I just don't understand. But at least on Ethereum today, right, you, you have had this kind of system outcompete uh, order book based exchanges. Is this purely because of like, is this because of gas costs? Is it because of latency or is there like some other reason? Yeah, Uniswap works because it's simple and also because the fees are very high um, and the latency is very high. Like, so just imagine if, let's say if, if Uniswap, like, by the way, no one should be celebrating 30 basis points of fees, right? Like, that's like really high. Like, I think our blended rate on Binance is like three basis points or something. I think most people's like seven or eight basis points. And like, that's been coming down steadily, right? Like, 30 basis points uh, is, is very expensive and generally should not be celebrated. But like, if you think about like Uniswap, right? Like if the price moves 31 basis points, then an arbitrager arbitrages and make, takes one basis point from the liquidity provider. But that, let's say that was cut down to five basis points. Like, so now if the price moves six basis points, then like someone is gonna come and take arbitrage and take a basis point, right? And you can imagine very quickly that like, if the, if the spread was five basis point fee instead of 30, that arbitragers would just be like robbing liquidity providers left and right because the amount of price volatility you need to justify an arbitrage is much less, right? Six, six times less for simplicity. And so like, ironically, because the system is, the block times are slow to update and because the fees are high, the system like works and liquidity providers have not gotten totally wrecked. Uh, and the fact that it's, it's simple to use, which is, which uh, I grant is, is an important feature. But like the future of trade, like trading should be one basis point, right? Like we shouldn't be celebrating 30 basis point trades. We should be celebrating one basis point trades. And like, if you think about like, how do you get to one basis point? Like that's a much harder problem to do <laughs> in like the liquidity pool model uh, because then arbitrage are just going to take money left and right. So it, it, they're cool, but I just don't, I don't see how they're going to out. Like when latency gets down to, you know, 100, 200, 300 milliseconds and when fees are effectively zero, like trading gas costs are effectively zero, I just don't understand how you compete with a central limit order book. I'd like to take a, a step back perhaps on this DeFi topic and the starting point I'd like to take this is, you know, what, in each of our early days in Bitcoin, we, uh, we all had this kind of way of explaining Bitcoin and, you know, we kind of like share these anecdotes for how we would explain Bitcoin to people. But it, it seems like DeFi is like not a very simple concept to explain to a non-crypto person. And uh, at, at least for me, it's not easy. And I, I haven't seen really sort of a convergence around how we explain DeFi uh, to non-crypto folks. How, how do you explain DeFi to a non-crypto person? Like, how do you explain what is the, um, you know, the value proposition for DeFi? Am I explaining this to like a, a finance person or to like my mom? <laughs> maybe someone, maybe someone in between. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I was explaining this, if I was explaining DeFi in one sentence to like someone who works like, in financial markets, like at another hedge fund or something, I would say it's a way to do large scale risk management and transfer between parties non-custodially or like without counterparty risk, basically. If I were to say it in like one sentence, that would be, that would be it. And it's kind of a vague and abstract, but like another finance person would hopefully understand the implications of that. If I had to explain this to like more of a retail audience, I would probably not emphasize the non-custodial nature of it. And I would emphasize the like, the UX of just like, moving your money around basically like stop with the three day waiting times every time you move between PayPal and your bank and like between Robin hood and your bank and, and whatever. And it's just like, you can move your money between all of these services in like 10 seconds and like just do any, right. Whether you're buying stock or a bond or whatever, or paying someone just like everything just works in 10 seconds or less. That's how I would explain it to like a normal retail user. Like, isn't that how money should be? Yeah, no, I agree. That's that, that's a good uh, that's a good way to explain it, and and I feel like the that's how money should be argument or or way to explain it is is sort of one that I think catches lots of people 
lots of people's attention. But I think one of the things that that a lot, lots of people will often ask about DeFi is like, oh, it's it's very speculative, right? And, and and this is sort of seen as as a bad thing, especially by regulators. I think since since we're on the on the top, you know, we'll probably talk about that at some point. But does it make sense these days to think of DeFi or at least the use cases on DeFi to be mostly speculative? And do you consider that to be a good thing or a bad thing? And is it bad for DeFi's image? I would say, like, is it um, is it detrimental detrimental to how DeFi is perceived by you know the retail audience, but also uh, you know regulators? Yeah. So, if I were to sum up the net output of the entire DeFi ecosystem today, I would say that it is a bunch of shitcoin traders trading shitcoins against each other, and I think that is the ultimate compliment. Like, what is the first thing that people did with Bitcoin? Was like Silk Road. And then like, and then like, and then there was like casinos and online gambling games and like, look at Ethereum and it was like more or less the same thing. And like, so I think DeFi today is just like a reflection of, of that, that like when you create global permissionless censorship, which is in financial rails, the first thing people are going to do are create more things, which is fine. I think that the fact that it works for large scale gray markets, the things is a testament to everything else that it could work for. But yeah, the net output today is a bunch of shitcoin traders trading shitcoins against each other, which is great. Like, I think that's fantastic. It ultimately facilitates open access, like financial access to stuff, whatever stuff may be. Today, it's you know mostly other DeFi tokens, but like you just change out the nature of the token tomorrow, and like oh, aha, like now you're democratizing financial access for a lot of people. The question is, how do you get beyond people just speculating and trading, you know, speculative assets? And like you, you kind of sort of there's two ish things you need to do. One is you just need to get new people into the system and, and like grow the net number of people, and then two is you need to have Call it non-speculative assets. So, like, for example, uh, let's take Compound today as an example. It's a governance token that theoretically governs the, like this money market thing. It's not like the whole thing is kind of reflexive. It's just like, okay, we have people who use it. Like, I guess if you control governance, you could rob everyone, just change the whole system and rob everyone. But absent like robbing everyone, it's not clear why someone should pay to like hold comp tokens. I mean, there may be fees in the future. You know, we'll see. But like that's all kind of squishy right now. Like it's very unclear how that's going to happen, and like what the fees will be and how to do a DCF. So a compound is like you know somewhat speculative asset. But like look at Wi-Fi for example, right? And thing produces fees like definitively. So like that's good. And like what if we can just get more non-speculative assets in the system? We've been for a long time thinking about how do you get people trading trillions of dollars of stuff on blockchain rails. And I feel pretty good that the answer is synthetic assets, like. You can replicate synthetic financial exposure to any asset in the world that has a public price feed. Um, we already know how to do this. It's called perpetual swap contracts. Perpetual swap contracts in FX markets in like Europe and Asia trade like I don't know hundreds of billions or trillions per day. And in crypto, like the perpetual swap contract facilitates most of Bitcoin and Ether trading trades via the perpetual swap contract and not via spot. So we already know how to do this. Like it definitively works. All the finance and economics and game theory is all proven. Uh, we just need to replicate that on top of the blockchain. Uh, and once you do then anyone in the world should be able to buy Google stock or Apple stock or Tencent or Alibaba or Tesla or whatever, right? But like any asset that is a publicly observable price feed, um, you will be able to get replicated exposure on blockchain rails. And like, if you look at where we are now, like that we're not very far away from that happening, right? Like that feels like it's going to happen in the next six to 12 months. Because like all you can, oracles are there, you know, like USDC, like you've got settlement currencies now with USDC and USDT at, at some meaningful level of scale, maybe DAI. Um, maybe Ether, you know, who knows, but like all of those pieces are kind of coming together. And so I expect to see perpetual swap contracts for kind of sort of all asset classes pretty soon. And once that happens, then you enable the next wave of, of entrepreneurs to go build like the next gen Robinhood, but like probably not for Americans because Americans are probably just going to use Robinhood, but for like Latin America, Southeast Asia, like large part, like Eastern Europe, like large parts of the world. Those people who cannot access American equities or Chinese equities today, for example, should be able to pretty trivially access those things right through synthetic exposure. What's the, um, you, you, you mentioned you know, Latin America and sort of like the, the, the geographical aspect of you know, how, how crypto can reach you know, populations that perhaps don't have access to financial, uh, to financial markets, um, or at least as well as we do in Europe and the U.S., you know, coming back on this idea that crypto can, you know, has a lot to lose, I think, to regulation coming down on it pretty hard. 
what do you think is the risk that you know in the next ten years we we have sort of two crypto ecosystems, one that's decentralized that sort of lives in a bubble and has a very hard time interacting with existing financial systems, and then a regulated crypto that um, you know has licenses and is able to be listed on centralized exchanges and can be where where users can on like on ramp. Uh, with fiat, et cetera. Um, is that something that you think about? And is that something that goes into your investment thesis? We do think about it a, a, a fair bit. It, right now, like definitively, the, e -per the crypto ecosystem lives in a completely separate universe from traditional finance. And that's like very obvious to all of us. Um, and there's like this weird kind of bridges that like take you back and forth sometimes. And like they're slow and kind of hard to use and kind of crappy, right? And like we use them because we have to. There's not a very clear, like even if you assume regulars, like um, regulators are like super excited about crypto and want to like magically integrate permissionless crypto with like permission f finance, like it's actually not clear technically how you do that in like a super elegant way. Like it kind of feels like what you do now, except maybe you make some things a little bit smoother, but like there's not a, it just feels kind of, it's just like a hard problem. So I think the probability that like traditional finance and crypto somehow merge feels impossible. But like, like you can take, like maybe if Libra is like wildly successful, there's like some sort of weird like merging or something where like slowly people kind of transition from like old banking to like Libra's permissioned crypto banking thing. Like that's plausible if you look out far enough in the future and cross your fingers and hope. But um, yeah, that's, you know, just too hard to forecast. Um, our kind of default assumption is that um, these two universes exist in parallel. And that slowly, um, over time, people start doing more and more stuff in the new parallel universe because of like the obvious benefits of like it's twenty four seven and then no transaction fees and non custodial and all these magical things. And you know, merchants slowly start accepting it, and, and like different types of financial services and whatever start using it in a kind of very decentralized, organic, grounds up kind of a way. Um, that's kind of our default assumption. I, I suspect what you'll see start to see happen in three to five years is. Like enough banks and other smart folks will be like, okay, look, this like technical model of like have a private key and sign some messages and like do, you know, cool things. Like this is like anyone with a brain who like looks at this is like understands like this is the correct model in terms of like how it, money should be. And so you're going to see kind of the traditional banking system in different parts of the world start to try and adapt this in different ways and points in time. China is starting this now with their DCEP thing. It's not entirely clear to me how it's going or how it actually works, but like they're obviously starting. You've seen American banks talk about this a fair bit. Like JP Morgan announced JPM coin, which was just a dollar on like a permission blockchain. Like this is like a year and a half ago or something. And then nothing has come of it as far as I can tell. So you can already see like everyone understands that, like this is going to happen. It's just no one kind of knows how to, how to get there. Uh, it's not clear what the impetus is to like get over the hump. Uh, but like it's, it's going to happen. I, I suspect the... the force of will from the CEOs of these large institutions will not be there until crypto markets are mature enough and large enough and real enough that like they have to care. And it's clear today the answer is they don't care because the crypto markets are too small and too irrelevant for them. But like I think in three to five years that will no longer be true. Like you can you, you can see a world where like like in fast forward three years, if Tesla, Apple and Google perpetual swap contracts are trading like, I don't know, $20 billion a day, which does not seem like that seems totally on the on table. Then like those guys are gonna be like, okay, this is real. What is this? How does this work? Like, how do we, what do we do about this? And then they're all gonna start to respond in their own weird, funny ways. Uh, and like how that culmination of discussions goes of both among the banks and among the regulators is like, and across different geographies, right? Like it's really hard to forecast the net output of, of all of those discussions. Yeah, I mean, for me actually using uh, Yearn was like a pretty uh, something that really changed my perception on like how close we are because yearn just feels like you know we can basically you can put some US dollar coin into it right? and then it can gets automatically deployed across different protocols and like you know put where they earn the most money and you know the, his philosophy was very much of this like savings account and you can absolutely see that, the, and, and of course, the interest is very high at this point, much, much higher than anything you can, you can get in a traditional finance system. Now, is it sustainable? Maybe not, but you can immediately see that this is 
very close to being like a superior, you know, US dollar account for you know most of the world. And I, mean, I think that's, I mean, of course, the UX is still a bit like, you know, not so great. And you have the gas problems with the costs and stuff like that. But it's very close. Yeah. Like, we tell all of our LPs, like some of whom aren't really into crypto, we're just like, look, like, please get them in a MetaMask and just go, like, trade something on Curve, then go trade something on Uniswap, then go put it in Compound, and then go put something in Yearn, right? And just, like, do that whole set of actions in, like, 15 minutes or less. And then think about what, how long would it have taken you to do the equivalent set of actions in web, you know, traditional financial rails. And like, it, it's like such a striking difference of, of like, right, like how you accomplish these two objectives. And like, it's just obvious. So I just like to say, this is how money should be. Like, it's clear that that is how money should be. Yeah, no, I, I think it's clear that that's how money should be. I'm, I mean, you guys are, you guys are familiar with the, the digital finance package that, uh, that uh, came out of the EU Commission a couple of weeks ago. Uh, not super familiar, no. So th- this this is a, a, a regulatory proposal that is coming out of the EU Commission. It can take you know, up to three years to be to be passed uh, into law, but uh, it aims to regulate crypto in Europe. There are some things in there that are pretty damaging to some of the core infrastructure in crypto, or at least the ability for that infrastructure to continue to exist, or companies to build this infrastructure. So, for example, things like stable coins. There's extremely high capital requirements for asset-backed uh, stable coins. And it's not even sure, we're not even sure, looking at this regulation, if things like DAI are even, you know, will, will be considered legal in Europe. And uh, at least in this first version, things like interest-bearing tokens are uh, forbidden. So, you know, th- this is just sort of like glossing over some of the, some of the things that are in this initial, in this initial paper. But looking at this, you know, it's 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 sort of a a bleak uh, future for DeFi, at least in Europe. I'm wary that you know we'll end up in a situation where DeFi gets regulated, you know, to the teeth, and we, um, you know, all all the all these things, right, that that we're seeing being built in the ecosystem, whether it's Compound, things like that, uh, Uniswap, etc., have a difficult time continuing to exist in that framework. So yeah, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that, but that's just sort of like where my head is at this moment, at the moment, with regards to the future of DeFi. Yeah, so I mean, like the the bear case for DeFi is that basically in every major jurisdiction, even minor ones, the government perceives it as a threat to their local sovereignty, and they they go out of their way to ban it. And if they ban it early enough in their respective life cycles in each country, then like the network effects don't you know like over like right like. Uber worked because the government said, like, it's illegal and people said, fuck you, like, I want to ride a taxi and, like, this isn't the right way to, like, get around. And, like, Uber just grew super, super fast and basically broke much loss. Finance probably, DeFi probably won't grow as fast as Uber did. Like, Uber is a very viral thing, right? Like, you get on a cab with your friends and everyone's like, wow, that was great. And, and so it's, like, organically viral in a way that DeFi probably is not, or at least doesn't, doesn't appear to be. So I think given that reality of, like, the, the, the K factor on like the coefficient of growth is probably much lower for DeFi than it is for like Snapchat or TikTok or Uber or whatever. It's it, that that does seem like a real risk that just like governments ban it just kind of systematically all over the world or or like make it hard enough to use that like my mom is like, no, nah, the government said it's illegal, I'm not gonna try and use it. Um and like my guess is probably like 75% of the population, like if the government says it's illegal, like won't do it. You, you know, like you may have different perspectives of like what that you think that percentage is, but like my kind of intuition is is it's in that range. And so if you kill cap your market size by 75%, that's unfortunate. That probably just means that DeFi is relegated to being like, again, this own parallel universe that like is a totally separate, you know, place. And it will always just be kind of a gray market. Um, that outcome, you know, means that like DeFi will be larger than it is today for sure, that outcome. But like, is that a million daily active users or is that... 25 million daily active users is pro- probably somewhere in that range. It's probably not 100 million daily active users, right? So, you know, like you still have growth from where we are, but it's just not like there's no path to a billion users in that in that outcome. Do, do you think that that the um, you know we, we we saw this kind of exuberance in in 2017, and I guess we're kind of seeing a little bit of that exuberance now with with all of this kind of degen trading and DeFi, all this degen activity. Um, do you think that the community would be wise to build this stuff with a little bit, like be a little bit more careful when building these things to not, 
you know, stir up the wrong kinds of narratives or, um, or, you know, the, the, the attention of people that could harm the ecosystem, right? So like, should we, should we be more careful and not building like super speculative assets that, um, where like the risks are super high, et cetera? I mean, I'm a, I'm a pretty big believer in like capitalism and not telling other people what to do. And so like, I can sit here and wish and say, man, if only these idiots wouldn't tweet these dumb things and attach to regulators, but like my beliefs about idiots tweeting things is kind of irrelevant. So people need to be able to do whatever they want to do. And like the idea that we're going to somehow as a community, like collectively agree on some bounds is like just not, not, not practical. <laughs> That's also called cancel culture. And like cancel culture is like very scary very quickly. Um, I don't want to go down that whole kind of rabbit hole, but like I'm generally supportive of letting people do whatever they want to do uh, up until the point of like injuring other people and, and breaking some bad laws. Well, I, I guess we are a little bit on the topic and we actually haven't discussed this on the podcast before, I think, but how do you think this is going to play out in this kind of tension between, you know, the, the crypto space that's you know, trying to advance, move fast, build new things, and then the regulators who are trying to like, you know, keep it under control. And, you know, recently we saw with like BitMEX that, you know, it seems like regulators are in salt lending, you know, there were some things right, where regulators are kind of like stepping up, you know, is it just a matter that, okay, people are going to build it elsewhere. And then at some point, let's say US regulators are going to kind of capitulate because they're at a disadvantage or like, how, how is that going to play out? Yeah. So we have some opinions here. Um, so we have spent some time, a fair bit of time talking to our lawyers, like understanding, like what are the risks all these offshore exchanges face and like doing, we've done a pretty thorough analysis on like an exchange by exchange basis and like which ones do we think are have more risks than the others? I like, can't really share the, the net outcomes of that other than I can tell you like which tokens we own because we've like exchange tokens because we've been pretty public about which, which ones we own. <laughs> so like you can kind of infer the, the net output of the analysis without really reading anything. Um, and we own BNB, HT, FTT, and SRM um, being the, the four exchange tokens we own. So a few comments. One, BitMEX was like really in a class of its own in terms of like breaking the rules. Um, that's not really a question. So I'm, I'm less worried about the other major exchanges than, than I am BitMEX by a meaningful margin. Two, like salt lending and like those things are different. So you have to realize there's different regulators that do different things. And I'm not really speaking to Europe or Asia. I'm just kind of taking a US centric view to answer this question. But like in the US, there's like four or so regulatory agencies that matter, kind of, sort of. Um, there's FinCEN, which is like money laundering stuff, which like those are the guys who just took out. Uh, and then like they work with the DOJ to like go arrest people. But like FinCEN is like money laundering. SEC is Securities Exchange Commission. CFTC is leverage and derivatives. And um, IRS for paying taxes. And like the IRS has been like, hey, people, please pay your, pay your taxes on crypto. And like, you know, they ask you to certify, did you trade crypto in the last year or whatever? Right. But like the IRS is like, doesn't really hate crypto. It's just like they want to collect taxes. The SEC is primarily concerned on like swindlers swindling retail investors out of their money. And so like you've seen like the people who did like swindled, like the SEC went after them pretty hard. And then everyone else is kind of in this gray state of the world of like, is it a security? Is it not a security? And like, we don't really know, right? Um, but like, it's clear the SEC doesn't like hate these things and is not like actively trying to kill the crypto industry at large for people who issue things that are quasi security, quasi not security, like, you know, I don't know. But like, as long as you've acted in good faith, like it's clear that like, you're not, you're not gonna have that huge of, of you're not gonna have a criminal liability. You might have some civil liability, but you're not gonna have criminal liability. So like, I'm not really worried about them. CFTC is mainly just focused on like people like trading with leverage on futures, which like whatever, like, okay. Like again, like that's, even if you do that in an unregistered way, you know, people who trade with leverage are generally more sophisticated anyways. And like, it's like, okay, like that's not a criminal kind of a crime. Right? It's just like, okay, like it's, you know, you let people trade with too much leverage. And then FinCEN, which is like money laundering. And like of those, it's pretty clear that like the one that's like the most important is the money laundering one. And so the exchanges that facilitate that are the ones most at risk. And like BitMEX clearly did the least to combat money laundering. And so like, no surprise, they got the hammer. Will the other exchanges receive similar outcomes? Pro I mean, they've all done a lot more than BitMEX has to, to combat money laundering and, and try to detect it and, and fight it and such. One thing I've noticed having spoken to CEOs of basically all the major exchanges is like all the exchanges 
don't like crime. Like they really don't like people try and rob them all the time. And then people try and launder money through them. And like, they know that's bad for their businesses. It's a risk to all of them and to the industry as a whole. And so like, although the exchanges generally hate each other as like com brutal competitors, they are like remarkably cooperative when it comes to anything related to like combating crime. And I've like independently had this discussion with like basically all the major exchanges around the world. And they all like sing the exact same song because like they all understand the like collective risk they all face. So, um, you know, like that, that will continue to be buttoned up. Overall, I'm not super worried that like anything bad's going to happen, but you kind of never know. The other thing I think is really interesting to, to even think about game theoretically is like, okay, what happens if like, the, I don't know, the DOJ or like FinCEN just says like crypto is illegal. Like just they come out with some kind of like crazy statement, right? Um, and like what happens after that? And like the answer is like you quickly get a series of like, I don't know, Coinbase or Kraken or someone like sues the government and says like this is unconstitutional. And like that's going to quickly go up to the Supreme Court, right? Like that, that's going to happen in short order. And so like what, what is the argument that like some set of lawyers is going to make in front of the Supreme Court on this issue? And I mean, I'm not a constitutional lawyer or anything, but like my what I would say, given my current legal knowledge, is like I would frame this as an issue of property rights of like crypto is like a very is actually probably the strongest instantiation of property rights of anything in the world. Um, because private key is just, you know, like magic. And so if, like by basically trying to ban crypto or make crypto illegal, you're effectively as a direct attack on your ability to own something. Um, and that's like a direct attack on the notion of property rights. Um, and at least in the United, like the U.S., probably more than any other country in the world, has like the strongest enforcement of property rights. Um, and so I, I think that that argument would, would hold water at the Supreme Court level. Um, and so I'm optimistic that even in the event of like crazy government bureaucrats or crazy politicians doing things like saying crypto is illegal, I, I'm optimistic that like that will win. The property rights argument will win ultimately at the Supreme Court. Yeah, I mean, I think one... One important factor in my eyes is also just that the crypto space moves very quickly. And, you know, you have, okay, you had this token sale stuff, right? but the token sale stuff was going on for quite a while. And then, you know, you had this SEC white paper in the fall of 2018. And, you know, they started kind of cracking down, but it took them like years to basically like crack down on that. And then it was also just like way too much activity that they could really like control it. So they would have to say, okay, you know, we are going to kind of crack down a little bit on like some, the most egregious parts. And then now, of course, it's already moved on, right? And there's a lot of other things people are doing. And they're again, you know, behind and probably going to be behind, like, but you know, by a long margin. And then, so I think that's also just like the sheer, uh, you know, capacity on their end to like, evaluate projects, look at things and act is going to make it hard for them to take like a hard line stance because they just can't consistently enforce it. Yeah, correct. And, and, and they know that. And so given that they know that, they just say, okay, we have to go after the most, you know, egregious violators. And that's, that's you can see that's been clear, clear what they've done. Anyone who raised a lot of money got their attention and then people who did pretty nebulous things like the, the swindlers. And so talking a little bit about the, the crypto asset industry and multi-coin, like how has the industry changed since, you know, you guys got started to now? Uh, it's changed a, a lot. Um, I'll kind of quickly touch on, on markets and then more importantly touch on, uh, I think, kind of like the stuff we're all building. In terms of markets, I mean, when we got in in 2017, crypto markets were effectively 100% retail. Everything was designed for like a retail audience only. Um, you had basically only spot exchanges. You had a little bit of margin to like borrow and lever up, but, but not much. Um, there were very few, if any, professional market makers in the space. Uh, there was no, you know, very little futures or derivatives of any form. And then there was no like, in, I'll call it institutional services, like custodies and uh, fund administration and, and audit and all that stuff. Um, so it's been about three years since we started. Uh, today, all of those things are like radically different. Um, today, large scale institutions can invest in crypto safely with like through regulated, trusted custodians with auditors and all these magical things. There's tons of leverage available. There's not full blown prime brokerages, but like we're close to the point of getting to full blown, full blown prime brokerages. And um, like there's tons of, of futures and options and like well, everything kind of like works well. So the market structure is just like much more mature now and much less retail centric. The retail obviously is being served still. I don't mean that they're not being served, but just like 
the biggest dollars in the world are not retail dollars. And like those people are now be able to be served, which is good. In terms of like core infra infrastructure, I mean, like what we've seen happen over the last few years is like basically 2017 happens. Like the first use case that was good for crypto is raising money. So big bubble happens in Ether and a bunch of ICOs because of that. That causes a bunch of smart people to look at smart con Ethereum and say, okay, what is Ethereum? What are smart contracts? Like, okay, smart contracts seem important. Like this seems like a fundamentally important thing for the world. And then all these smart, all these smart cryptographers and, data and distributed systems people and database people all looked at Ethereum and they said, guys, this is like suboptimal in like so many ways. Um, like we can do better. And so all of those people like Nier and Solana and Definity and Coda, now known as Mina, and like all these people, right? Like all said, okay, like we can do better. And they all raised a bunch of money, basically say we can try and do better. And those, it turns out it took a lot longer than anyone thought to build any of those things. I, I've just realized anything proof of stake related is just like exponentially more complicated than proof of work in terms of just building it. And like, this is empirically true across, I think every single protocol. And so uh, they all raised a bunch of money. And then meanwhile, Ethereum figured out something that it's useful for. Like Ethereum obviously didn't go away. And they were like, hey, we can actually, the most useful thing here is to issue assets and then basically trade them and lend them and borrow them to each other in like interesting and different ways. That that happened. And, and so now we kind of know, you know, what what at least one fundamentally useful thing for, for smart contracts, which is DeFi. And, and so that's kind of what, what's happened. Uh, today, we have, the infrastructure is just so much better for using stuff. I mean, like, right, like Solana has been out for six months and like Serum is usable today. It's, it's clunky to onboard, but like once you're in and have a Solana wallet and everything, like it's pretty damn easy to use. Um, the same is true for Ethereum. Like once you have MetaMask set up or whatever, right? Like it's very easy to go uh, trade on Curve and Uniswap and Compound and Aave and all these things. And so the 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 cycle time of like what it takes to build a new application, onboard user, deploy it and onboard users. Like I feel like that time cycle is compressed about 10x over the last three years. Um, it's it's 10 times easier to launch a new thing today than it was then. That's a function of like tooling being better. Um, that's a function of like uh, wallet distribution being better and just like user education, at least on people who are in the crypto space. All, right, all of those things have improved enough that like it's actually 10 times faster and easier to launch something new, um, which is great. And then like you're also seeing now all of the what I'll call like tangential services are also starting to like really hit maturity. So uh, the graph is probably the most important one of those. And like it, you're, like large scale indexing and querying, again, it's like super important to do large scale applications. And then like other what I'll call tangential services. So things like are we even Filecoin? Like we're gonna want to store stuff that's not just a ledger entry. And like those are again like much more the Filecoin launches in three days. Are we even launched? Like it's now just kind of hitting its stride. So those kinds of things. And then wallets are just are just exponentially better, you know, now. Key management's better, like backup and recovery, like we have magic, we have Taurus, like Right, like all of those approaches are all like well, thoroughly understood and explored. Um, and they're just much, much easier to use. And so that kind of combination of things has just made the whole ecosystem, it's just much, in 2017, it was hard to use crypto. Today it's better, it, it's 10X better, but still not, you know, like as easy as Snapchat. Um, and so like that's happened. And um, you can see now the kind of primordial soup is like almost there for like some big breakout cool things to happen. Like we're not quite there, but like you can really tell like we're very close. And so I feel like that's kind of the summary of the last call it, three or four years. And so looking back in 10 years, uh, what do you think will have fundamentally changed in the way people transact and invest? And how much of that will be attributed to sort of crypto and DeFi? I mean, I'm in, I'm in this ecosystem because I'm like bullish on it and I think it's going to change the world. So whether it's pure, the question is like, is it permissionless? DeFi that like a hundred million people use every day, or is it permissioned DeFi? Um, and like, I don't know how to answer that question right now. I, I'm hoping it's permissionless, but you know, we'll see. In the event that it's permissionless, then like all the stuff we're doing now is like going to be game changing and all super important. In the event that it's permissioned, it depends. Like you could see a world where they just like fork the EVM or fork the WASM runtimes on Solana or Polkadot or whatever, and like. Say great is all just permission consensus now, <laughs> consensus and like thank you for all the free code and like that's totally a possible outcome or they'll rebuild it all because they're bureaucrats and that's what they do. I, I don't know. So those kind of seem like the three major outcomes of all of this. But I'm optimistic that at least the idea that like you will have your cash, so to speak, and like money will operate as as we all think it should. Like I'm optimistic that 
That I feel very confident will happen. It will probably be longer and messier than I would like, but I'm fairly certain that like the writing is on the wall and it's basically a foregone conclusion. And okay, maybe final question. What are the areas that you're like looking at today and learning about, you know, regarding to crypto and investing that you think are most underrated? So I, I think the most compelling use case for crypto I've seen uh, beyond DeFi is anything related to what I'll call internet infrastructure. Um, so I'm not referring to necessarily de like are we Filecoin, like decentralized storage or like um, decentralized compute, more focused on actually bandwidth management and like packet routing. Inter internet bandwidth is, is, fun is not fungible. Like I have an internet connection at my house in Austin and you have an internet connection in Berlin. Like those things are not fun, like those are not fungible, right? Like my internet connection needs to work here and yours needs to work there. Um, and so the internet is by definition decentralized. Um, and you just have tons and tons of, you know, routers and, and IP tables and whatever, right? And all these packets like magically wrap around the internet somehow. The question is kind of in, in, in like abstract, is the entire way that like we route packets today as economically optimal as possible? And I'm like 100% confident the answer is no, like not even close. So like, is there an opportunity to create permissionless ways to route packets that are like far more economically efficient than status quo. And we have made two bets so far on that thesis and I expect we'll make many more, but like I'm, I'm fairly confident the answer is you can do a lot better. Uh, so like looking at helium is our most public example of this where like helium is like the idea is look, AT&T and Verizon and Orange and Vodafone and these guys like build a bunch of literally towers and go like rent a bunch of land and run a bunch of backhaul and do all these things. But like, what if just you and I can like plug in a thing in our house and like get and like create bandwidth and share it and other people can pay per byte of data in real time, right? It's just like a totally, totally different model of like, how do you deploy enough towers to just blanket the entire world in radio waves? And like that model, I'm optimistic is going to like totally change like internet access and like how people access the internet all over the world. Uh, the other bet we made in that space is called Oxio, um, which is like a basically focused, it's kind of the opposite of Helium, where it's focused on um, making an exchange where like people can trade data. So like I have an AT&T 5 gig gigabytes that expires in 30 days. I can trade that for dollars in real time or resell it or whatever. But like having an exchange for data where like today mobile data is probably the world's largest commodity that is not financialized. Uh, when I mean not financialized, like look at oil or gas or like wheat or whatever, those are all financialized commodities. Mobile data is not a financialized commodity. And so uh, I feel pretty optimistic that like we will financialize that asset. There's going to be more stuff in this space. So like Althea is an interesting company, right? Like they've been doing uh, a bunch of work on like similar kind of helium model, but a little different. Um, there's a bunch of people right now working on uh, like incentivized mix nets or incentivized packet obfuscation, like NAM and Hopper and a handful of others. You can see, so like, and then you just see more peer-to-peer -peer mesh type of things. It's very clear to me that like some set of these are going to produce a large, large, large amount of value for the world. And we've been pretty, I think we've been probably the most active investor in, in that space. And I expect we will continue to be because uh, it just like fundamentally makes sense. Like internet infrastructure is decentralized. Um, it is not optimal. And like by enabling permissionless access and permissionless packet routing, you can achieve things that were not possible before. And so I'm like very excited about that like sector of stuff. Cool. Well, Kyle, thanks so much for coming on. It was a pleasure uh, to catch up. I'm excited to see how, uh, you know, how the next two and a half years turn out and how your, your investment thesis is going to play out in that time. Uh, 136 weeks. I'm counting down, Brian. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get it on the calendar. Put it in your calendar. <laughs> Put it on the calendar. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. 
and we look forward to being back next week.